Hello and welcome to the cardiovascular content on the CCRN Review. This is David Woodruff and I want to talk to you a little bit about the cardiovascular system. When you take a look at your handout, you see that there are a few concepts that are listed there, like the cardiac cycle, aortic pressure, and coronary artery perfusion pressure. So these are a few things that we probably need to be thinking about when we start to answer those questions. In addition, take a look at this picture here and consider the placement of the heart within the thoracic cavity. When we think about most pictures of the thoracic cavity, they give us this impression that the lungs are in this place over here, the heart is sitting here in the mediastinum by itself, and then we have other stuff going on in the abdomen. But all of these components are touching each other. Therefore, your patient who has a lung disease and has air trapping, the lungs are going to get bigger and they're going to start to press on the heart, which is going to decrease our cardiac output. So our patients who have COPD in many cases also have heart failure. In addition, those patients who have abdominal conditions maybe some liver failure or some other abdominal condition, can also end up having some problems with their lungs and their heart too because of the lack of compliance of the diaphragm and the abdomen. So just consider all of those things together. When you're looking at your patient with a heart problem and you're thinking, how can I improve cardiac output in this patient? Well, I've got to be thinking about all of those components around the heart too that may be impeding the patient's ability to be able to have a good cardiac output. As some background information, we do need to know just real basic stuff about the vasculature of the heart. They're not going to ask you for very specific arteries that are feeding the heart, but we do need to know the right coronary artery, the left coronary artery, including the circumflex and the left anterior descending. So we need to know those vessels when they may ask you questions on the exam. So they may ask you a question about a patient who has a right-sided MI or a patient who's having a, a inferior wall MI, and you need to be able to understand which one of these vessels is feeding that area. In addition, we also need to be looking at some of the components that make up our cardiac output. So when we're talking about optimizing somebody's heart condition or optimizing their cardiac output and improving their overall outcome, there's a lot of different components we need to look at. It's not just as easy as, hey, let's give the patient some positive inotropes, in order to be able to increase cardiac output. There's other components that are involved in the process. So we may not get the outcome we want because we're not considering all of those different components when we're taking a look at cardiac output. So let's take a look from the bottom up. We start out with our preload, our contractility, and our afterload. So these are the components that we normally think about as being part of our cardiac output as being part of hemodynamics is preload, contractility, and afterload. Those are components that affect stroke volume. In addition, heart rate also affects cardiac output. So we need to consider those pieces that we normally think about as being part of hemodynamics. And we also need to consider the heart rate because stroke volume times heart rate equals Cardiac output. Do you remember hearing that somewhere? That equation of stroke volume times heart rate equals cardiac output. In fact, it does. And the components of stroke volume are preload, contractility, and afterload. So again, our patient is having a low cardiac output state. We need to be looking at all of those components there at the bottom. Heart rate, preload, contractility, and afterload. Optimize those things if we're going to get an adequate cardiac output. Now, cardiac output is just part of the equation. Your patient can have a horrible cardiac output and still be very functional, right? So there's other components that are involved too, 
our SVR, systemic vascular resistance, our SpO2, so the amount of oxygen circulating in the blood, and our hemoglobin level. How are we going to bind oxygen to hemoglobin if we don't have any hemoglobin? So we need to have an adequate hemoglobin level in the body in order to be able to get oxygen to the tissues. So our goal when we're treating a patient who has a cardiac disease is not just, hey, let's optimize cardiac output, but we need to optimize oxygen delivery to the tissues so that our patient can have an optimum outcome, which involves cardiac output, but it also involves blood pressure, SpO2, and the hemoglobin level. We're going to come back and look at these components again when we talk about how we treat patients who have cardiac conditions. So here's another one of our tips. Avoid multitasking. Multitasking requires you to switch from one activity to another. You know, we often think of somebody who's a multitasker as somebody who is able to keep many things in the front of their mind at the same time. Well, the brain can only work with one activity at a time. So what's really happening is we're doing this switch tasking thing. So when you're studying, if you're also talking to your kids or doing some other activity at the same time and you think, hey, I'm just multitasking here. I'm trying to memorize these things or I'm studying this thing and I'm also making lunches or watching the news or whatever the case may be. If you're doing the multitasking thing, you're not going to be as effective as if you stop and do one thing at a time. Now, this is one of the pieces, we're going to come back to this again, but this is one of the tips that we really want to work on here studying for the CCRN. Break down your study time into small pieces, frequent small pieces during the day, so that you are repeating some of the same stuff over and over again, so that it kind of sinks in. But you're also doing it in little pieces often. That way you can really concentrate for a period of time and then move on to something else. People will often tell me, well, I'm going to take the whole day Saturday to study. And uh, at what point in time do you think the studying becomes less effective, right? It's not going to be effective for that whole eight hours, your brain's going to start to wander, you're, not, you're going to start to become mentally fatigued, and you're not going to be taking in as much as you were when you started. So break it up. Break it up into small chunks. Our next cardiac condition is acute coronary syndromes. So when our patient has decreased cardiac output, to the heart itself. For whatever reason, maybe there's a blockage of blood flow or maybe the patient has got decreased cardiac output as a result of some other condition. The patient can end up having an acute coronary syndrome. Now we used to call this angina, unstable angina, myocardial infarction, etc. Now we just kind of lump them all together into acute coronary syndromes because this thing is on a continuum. So you see the picture down there at the bottom? We have atherosclerosis and we're moving from stable angina, where we have a little bit of an obstruction of a vessel, and the patient may have some chest pain when they exercise, to unstable angina. Now the patient is having chest pain at rest. Okay. So if you think about this in terms of what's happening at the tissue level, we have ischemia, and then we start to get into injury when we have unstable angina, non-ST segment elevation MI, and then finally we move into necrosis. So we have ischemia, injury, necrosis moving across that picture at the bottom, across that atherosclerotic picture at the bottom, as we move from stable angina to unstable to end STEMI and then STEMIs. The presentation will be, in most cases, at least we assume in most cases, will be chest pain. Now, when we talk about these symptoms that a patient is going to have when they come into the hospital with an MI, 
That's what we're talking about. We're talking about people who are presenting for the emergency room. We're not talking about a patient who is in your ICU. This patient who's in your ICU who now develops in a myocardial infarction may not be able to experience chest pain, right? Because they may be either have an altered mental state or they may be sedated or treated for pain for some other reason. So they may not be able to tell you they're having chest pain. So we need to be watching for some of these other things, respiratory distress, nausea and vomiting, diaphoresis, EKG changes. That's the one that everybody talks about. Yeah, we're looking for EKG changes. Got a little EKG down here at the bottom showing ST segment elevation. Cardiac enzymes, we're going to look at those, right? What is the best indicator that your patient is having an acute coronary syndrome? Is it chest pain, nausea, diaphoresis, or respiratory distress? Interestingly, in patients who are in the hospital, okay, I'm not talking about the guy walking around on the street. You know, we know that that patient's probably going to present with chest pain. But in our patients in the hospital, the best indicator is respiratory distress. Because again, many of our patients are sedated or they have an altered level of consciousness or treated for pain and they may not experience the chest pain piece. Unfortunately, respiratory distress comes second. So that means if your patient is presenting with respiratory distress, we've already missed the chest pain part. We're further down the continuum. Nausea, diaphoresis, some of those additional symptoms may or may not be present. So that classic sign, chest pain, nausea, diaphoresis, respiratory distress, may not be present in every patient. When we have a patient present with respiratory distress, many times we're thinking respiratory. Oh, what respiratory problem could be occurring in this patient? But it could also be an acute coronary syndrome. So we have to rule that out. So we're going to manage and monitor our patient. We want to reduce the size of the infarction. Yes, in fact, reduce the size of the infarction. Now think about the infarction as being this dynamic circle on the heart. In the center of that circle, there is an area that is probably already necrotic. It's dead. You're not bringing it back. No matter what we do, we can revascularize, we can do all the fancy things we do. We're not bringing it back, it's dead. What will eventually happen is that the body will have an inflammatory process that occurs and we'll get scar tissue that forms there and takes the place of that dead tissue. Keep in mind, that area of dead tissue where the scar tissue is going to form will not be active in the cardiac function. It's not going to conduct electricity. It's not going to contract. So we want to make sure that we are reducing the size of that necrotic area to make it as small as possible. And that's why we do the things that we do in our treatment. See, if you were to say, well, okay, he's had an infarction. Nothing we can do. It's dead. It's dead. There's nothing we can do. Okay. But again, it's a dynamic circle. So think about a circle and think about it as being dynamic. The very center is necrotic. As we move out from this center, we start to get into area that's injured and area that is ischemic. We can save those two areas if we get that patient to the lab and we do a catheterization, PCI. Maybe we use some thrombolytics or we take the patient to the OR and we do a cabbage. So that's why we're doing all of those things. We want to try to reduce the size of the infarction as small as possible so the patient will have the smallest amount of long-term disability as a result of this myocardial infarction. Well, we're going to have to take that patient to the operating room or to the lab or whatever. In the meantime, we may want to do something to offset some of the damage that's being done to the heart. So we can do that by trying to balance delivery and consumption of the oxygen to the heart. Okay, so think about this balance 
whenever we're talking about somebody having an ischemic area anywhere, we have our delivery side and we have our consumption side. If the consumption is very high, then the delivery is going to have to be even higher to be able to meet that really high consumption. In the heart, there's a couple things that are going to increase consumption. Heart rate. The more times per minute the heart beats, the more oxygen it consumes. Okay, that makes sense? And stretch. Okay, remember Starling's Law of the Heart? The more you stretch it, the harder it contracts, right? So the more we stretch it, the harder it contracts, the more oxygen it uses. That's Starling's Law of the Heart. So we want to decrease oxygen consumption. We need to slow the heart down and decrease the stretch. Well, what's stretching the heart? Venus return. And what's one of the first things we do when a patient comes in and a patient has any kind of a problem and their blood pressure is low, we give them fluids, which is going to cause more venous return coming back to the heart, more stretching of the myocardium, and increasing oxygen consumption. All right, well, that's really not the way we wanted to go here, is it? On the other side of the coin, we can increase our diastolic filling time. That's when the vasculature of the heart fills the heart with oxygen. So during diastole, now during systole, the heart's contracting. Think about it as one big muscle is just contracting. It's squeezing blood out of the vasculature. So it's during diastole that the coronary vessels are filling. So if the patient has a very fast heart rate, that means there's not enough diastolic time to be able to fill those coronary vessels and get oxygen to the tissue. We can also give some medication as a coronary vasodilator, such as nitroglycerin. In some cases, we may give the patient oxygen if their oxygen saturation is low. And we'd want to revascularize because that's where we're going to open up those vessels. And that's this is what this little picture here is showing is that we re revascularized by adding a vessel, so doing the cabbage piece. So the American College of Cardiologists, American Heart Association guidelines is, first of all, reperfusion therapy. So, you know, the one thing we want to do is we want to reperfuse the heart so that we're getting oxygen to that area so that we can try to limit the size, remember, of that dynamic circle. We want to limit the size of that dynamic circle so that we don't have as much dysfunction of the myocardium. Aspirin, uh, ACE inhibitors, uh, ARBs, which are angiotensin receptor blockers, uh, beta blockers, statins. When you start to look at this list of things, the ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, what are those things doing? How are those helping in a patient who has a myocardial infarction? Well, a patient with an MI is going to have decreased cardiac output because the heart isn't functioning as well as it should. Whenever we have decreased cardiac output, it doesn't matter what the cause. The body is going to stimulate the sympathetic nervous system. So the sympathetic nervous system kicks in and it tells the heart to beat harder and faster. That's why we're giving a beta blocker. The beta blocker blocks the sympathetic nervous system. Okay, what does a beta blocker do? Beta adrenergic blocker. It's blocking the sympathetic nervous system. We give an ACE inhibitor to block the angiotensin, renin-angiotensin system, so that we're decreasing the blood pressure. Okay, well, why would we want to decrease the blood pressure in somebody with a low cardiac output state? Because it decreases SVR. There's not as much resistance for the heart to have to pump against. The main key with our patients who have any kind of a coronary problem is we want to plug in the pump. Think about this like an IV pump. Your IV pump is beeping and it's saying that it's unplugged. What do you need to do? Plug in the pump. Is it going to help to turn up the rate? No, that sounds silly, doesn't it? But oftentimes what we do with our cardiac patients is we turn up the rate. So instead, we want to plug in the pump. Plugging in the pump here for the heart is plugging it into oxygen delivery, oxygen. 
Well, hopefully your patient's EKGs don't look like this. <laughs> Apparently, that heart's having a little bit of problem. It's trying to reach out. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about our right ventricular infarct. When we talk about heart attacks, we usually think of the left side of the heart. But the right side of the heart can be affected as well. The impact of the right side is generally less than the left. The left does a lot more work. So usually the left is the one that's going to be affected because it does more work. The right side could be basically passive, allowing blood to flow through to get to the left side. But if a right-sided infarct occurs, what we will see is, as we may expect, jugular venous distension. Okay, so you have a patient who's exhibiting signs of an MI, having chest pain and shortness of breath, and you look and you see jugular venous distension. And by the way, I will talk about how to measure that. But you see jugular venous distension in your patient, and you're thinking, oh, this patient's having an MI. How would I know that it's a right-sided MI? In a left-sided MI, the blood from the heart, which isn't pumping well, is going to back up into the lungs. Right? Your patients with heart failure have rowels in the bases. Right? They've got fluid building up in the bases of the lungs. In a right-sided infarct, the blood will back up in the systemic circulation. Therefore, the patient's going to have clear lungs. and they'll have hypotension. So here's the classic triad of symptoms of a right ventricular MI, is jugular venous distension, clear lungs, and hypotension. So how do we treat it? Well, we want to keep blood flowing through that right side so it can get to the left side. That's where we really need it. So we want to maintain our adequate filling pressures, Avoid diuretics if we can, and nitroglycerin. The patient's highly sensitive to nitroglycerin with a right-sided infarct. And it says avoid. doesn't mean that we won't use them at all. In some cases, we will. But just be very careful because this patient's going to be highly sensitive to that nitroglycerin. Hemodynamically, you'd expect that the CVP is going to be greater than 10 and the CVP will be within five of the pulmonary artery occlusive pressure. Not usually like that. That's the end of part one of the cardiovascular CCRN review. Join me in part two.